Welcome. My name is Joe White. I'm director of the Center for Policy Studies and chair of the Political Science Department here at Case Western Reserve University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Global Currents discussion. Uh, and we should begin by thanking the generosity of Ms. Eloise Briskin, who makes this kind of programming possible. Uh, today's topic is, in my mind, uh, one of the most important that one could possibly discuss in terms of public policy and the future of the, uh, of, of the nation, which is essentially the uh, relationship between the U.S. economy and the international economy. That is particularly relevant or obvious here in Cleveland, where we worry all the time about manufacturing. Uh, but there's a tremendous amount of commentary within the financial press and within the regular elite press about the relationships between these two levels of economies. Uh, and a lot of it takes the form of uh, commentary on a few issues. One of the issues that is frequently talked about is the U.S. federal budget deficit and the claims that uh, because of the U.S. federal budget deficit, a greater and greater amount of U.S. debt is owned by the Chinese and that this is a terrible thing and all sorts of horrible things could happen as a result. And this is uh, talked about in terms of a global imbalance of, uh, of essentially uh, fiscal behavior and budgetary behavior. At the same time, other people point out that the reason the Chinese can buy all this debt uh, is because they have massive uh, trade surpluses, although their trade surplus with the rest of the world is actually not as, not, I mean, their overall trade surplus, if I remember correctly, is not as large as their trade surplus with the United States. So they've got a huge trade surplus with the United States. And that this, uh, is in fact an, is, is that the trade deficit, both the trade surplus of the Chinese and also the, the larger trade deficit of the United States as a whole, is another form of global imbalance and is directly related by some views to uh, the decline of manufacturing because some of it at least consists of the fact that we are buying manufactured goods from elsewhere instead of making them here. Uh, so, that, so there's another claim. Other people claim that what's, what's really unbalanced is wage levels. Uh, and policies about uh, justice and consumption within the individual countries. And again, there are claims that there are differences between the, that some of the results in the United States are due to differences in policies between the United States and other countries. And so, in all these ways and more, the question of the relationship between the U.S. economy and other economies is frequently phrased in terms of these things called global un unbalances and frequently, especially in terms of the trade deficit and the budget deficit. And so I thought it would be, you know, and so from the standpoint of both the uh, relations, foreign policy, and just our local economy, from both perspectives, uh, the question of so-called global imbal imbalances, or in fact, in fact, global imbalances, the question is how, how important they are, is one of the most important that could possibly be uh, looked at. And so it is a great pleasure to be able to host this program today uh, the, uh, and to, in particular, uh, have our two guest speakers. Um, I will admit here that I have known Robert Blecker, the chair of the economics department at American University since uh, graduate school days. Um, we have had, I have had the pleasure of asking him questions to explain the economy to me. Uh, well, I, we did this for a couple of decades before I left Washington because uh, not only were we both in the uh, Bay Area together, but then we were subsequently uh, both in Washington together at very different institutions. He was uh, being a professor at American University and researcher with uh, the Economic Policy Institute. I was at the Brookings Institution. And the economic uh, views of the Brookings Institution and the Economic Policy Institute are not entirely in line with each other. Um, which made it particularly good for me to be able to talk to Robert. <laughs> um, uh, Robert has continued to publish extensively on aspects particularly of, of international trade and, um, and has now, uh, I don't want to say progressed in his career because <laughs> he, he knows that it is simply a burden, but is now the chair of the economics department at, at the American University. Uh, he will give a talk and then we will have uh, a, a response, and I'm really pleased about this uh, by Dr. Owen Humpage, who is a senior economic advisor specializing in international economics at the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank. And has been uh, working in these fields for 
longer than uh, Professor Blecker and, and myself. I mean, I, we've only been working in this since like 1980 or so. Uh, he uh, Dr. Humpage received his PhD from Case Western Reserve University in 1974. And there are very, very few people in the world, if, if any, who are in a better position to talk, to talk about uh, global imbalances in the global economy with an understanding of what that means to Cleveland. Uh, to, to our local community, and I would say to uh, what we might call the American heartland in general. Uh, so it is. Uh, uh, so the so they will both speak, and then we will have a question session. We would like to ask you when we because we are recording. When we do the questions, uh, uh, we will bring a microphone around so the uh, so the uh, questions can be recorded, and then we will wrap up with my distinguished coll colleague, Sue Helper, who is the chair of the economics department at, uh, at our university, will give some final concluding remarks. So with that, thank you very much all for coming, and it is my great pleasure to present uh, my friend and uh, somebody from whom I've learned a lot over the years, Robert Blecker. Well, I want to thank Joe for that kind introduction and for charitably not saying how long ago we were graduate students together, and to also say that if I ever learned anything about budgeting and fiscal policy and the politics thereof, it was definitely from Professor White. Uh, so if there are any questions related to the real world of fiscal policy, I'll just defer them to him. Uh, so I will talk about these global imbalances. Uh, the focus of my talk actually is on the U.S. role in them, but it will certainly, by extension, talk about uh, various other parts of the world. Now, I'm a little bit close to this screen, but I'll attempt to occasionally twist around and highlight something with my pointer if, if it works. Uh, so just to start this off, as uh, Professor White was saying, uh, there's been a large uh, trade deficit of the United States uh, for a long time, or at least there was until the current crisis and, and recession. And just before that, so around 2006, 2007, it was looking like this was something that was never going to go away. Uh, it seemed to be quite intractable. Uh, many of the things that are normally supposed to bring about a lower trade deficit, such as a lower dollar, well, the dollar had fallen. And a lower budget deficit, well, the budget deficit actually had come down for a while before, before the crisis, the financial crisis. Uh, and yet the trade deficit didn't seem to be uh, adjusting much. Uh, and while the U.S. had this large deficit, of course, it actually transmitted demand. So all those imports Joe was talking about us uh, buying were creating demand for goods and services from other uh, regions of the world, which in some sense came to depend on that uh, American demand to, to stimulate their own uh, economies. So to sort of leap a little bit forward to where we'll go at the end of the talk, during what we now call the Great Recession of these last couple years, uh, well, the trade deficit has really come down and uh, really in, in quite uh, astounding ways and, and dimensions in, in just a couple of, uh, of years. As we look back now, the, the statistics show it was actually starting to decline a little bit even before we officially had a recession and a financial crisis, and then it just collapsed uh, since then. Uh, though, of course, that also means that the U.S. stimulus to the rest of the world has rather uh, abated uh, since then. So we have a lot of questions going forward because we really don't know yet how our recovery is going to go. Uh, we're just in the beginning phases of it. Uh, will these large surpluses and imbalances, uh, foreign surpluses, U.S. deficits, reappear? Will they get big again? Will they not? Uh, is there an adjustment coming and what will be the consequences? So these are some questions that at this point we can only speculate on, but I hope to give you some foundations for speculating like that. So just to give you an idea of who's involved in this, actually the global imbalances are remarkably concentrated in, in a relative handful of countries. So the deficit, now I, I deliberately chose data from 2007, not the most recent, because I don't want the crisis effects to be in here. So this is from what you might call the past, the last cyclical peak. The global economy kind of peaked in 2007 and the U.S. economy peaked in 2007. So at that time the U.S. had a Current account deficit, the broadest measure of the trade balance of somewhere between seven and eight hundred billion. Uh, and all the other deficits in the world are, are relatively small, all less than a hundred billion. And really three countries alone accounted for the vast majority of the world's surpluses, China, Germany, and Japan, plus a couple of resource exporters like Saudi Arabia and Russia had relatively large surpluses. 
But all the others, I just picked a few of the sort of G8 plus G20 countries here. It's not all of them, but just picked a few major countries from each region of the world. But I'm not missing any big surpluses or deficits here. So it's largely, well, it's not bilateral, maybe a quadrilateral or you know, it's a small number of country story between the US and a few major surplus countries. Though China is perhaps the most well known of those at this time, is not the only one. Now, a couple of years ago, well, I, I've been writing about this topic for four years, ever, uh, sorry, for a long time, what did I say? For about 20 years, <laughs> ever since Joe and I used to have those coffees together in Washington and, and, and uh, uh, talk to each other about these issues. Um, and I tried to do research on other things to get away from this. I really got tired of it after a while. But a few years ago, my friends at the Economic Policy Institute said, come on, you have to write something about this again. So I wrote a paper for them called The Trade Deficit Trap, How It Got So Big, Why It Persists, and What to Do About It. Now, although it came out in July 2009, I can only attribute that to the sluggishness of the editorial process at EPI. In fact, I wrote the first draft in the middle of 08, no, January of 08, so it was before really any, any of the worst of the financial crisis happened and before we knew there would be a Great Depression and back when the deficit was over 700 billion. Um, it's now very clear that I was entirely too pessimistic at that time about the prospects for an adjustment in the trade balance, which, you, as you will soon see, got, has gotten much smaller since then. Though another way of looking at it is that I was too optimistic uh, about the growth of the U.S. economy uh, following that, that time. And the dilemma is that, you know, as we all know, the American consumers were over-indebted, and there was the housing bubble and, and all those things that happened here. Uh, and since then, consumers have really retrenched, and, and spending has, has uh, kind of stagnated. Uh, but if we don't go back to all that spending, well, that'll be good for the trade deficit. But I'm afraid it also won't be good for an economic recovery. So we're in perhaps quite a bit of a, a, a dilemma here. So anyway, this is sort of the state of my thinking about two years ago when I was uh, working on this. So I came up with this idea of a trade deficit trap because I don't believe in any monocausal explanation of the trade deficit. Uh, and there are many different factors, and there's a lot of sort of chickens and eggs in here, things that each cause each other. It's very hard to disentangle the, the causality. So on the right-hand side of this are more or less what you might call the real side things that I had something, I think had something to do with it, a loss of competitiveness, uh, pressure to outsource, industrial decline. Uh, but some of these are actually effects as well as causes. Uh, I believe that some of the U.S. trade agreements, while on paper opening up foreign markets more than they open the U.S. market in reality because of other provisions, deep integration pr pr provisions, ended up more encouraging outsourcing than anything else uh, and the middle class income squeeze. But on the left hand side are the financial side and the foreign side which are extremely important. Uh, a trade deficit is simply the other side of, a coin, of the coin of a net financial inflow or borrowing from other countries. That in turn was fueled by things like the asset bubbles in the U.S., which attracted funds, the high foreign saving rates that, that Joe alluded to, that Ben Bernanke has, has uh, written about, uh, massive foreign central bank intervention in foreign exchange markets, uh, which I will talk about a lot uh, this afternoon, uh, the high value of the dollar for a long time, and what I believe are the persistent effects of that even after it began to fall. Uh, I'm not going to go through every arrow here, but to point out that all these factors in some ways kind of mutually supported each other. So that's where I got the idea for a trap, that it was very hard to get out of it because all these things were feeding into everything else. I mean, just to mention one example, you could, for example, blame the low saving rate of the uh, U.S. household sector, and definitely it had a role. But then you have to ask yourself a question, well, how is it possible that we could go on uh, running a budget deficit, I'm talking now about the George Bush years, running a budget deficit, a fairly moderate one, but we're running a budget deficit, and having fairly robust investment spending, except especially in the housing sector, while nobody was saving. And of course we know the answer. Well, it was only possible because of the borrowing from abroad. Oh, but that's the other side of the coin of the trade deficit. So what's the cause and effect? It's very much chicken and egg, and, and you can't just you know, believe that it, it, it's one way or the other. It's all supporting each other. So uh, Joe mentioned the idea of the so-called twin deficits, and I do want to talk about that for, for a minute. This is the little arrow here with the dashed line and the question marks because it's the one thing that I think is the uh, 
perhaps the least important or most overemphasized in this. Actually, I think in editing this the other night, I put the arrow in the wrong place. I, the question mark is supposed to refer to direct causality from the federal budget deficit to the trade deficit. Actually, what my research shows uh, is that it more explains the private saving investment gap rather than the trade deficit directly. But anyway, um, the idea that the federal budget deficit and the foreign trade deficit are so-called twins uh, was born, I guess, almost 30 years ago in the early 1980s, back in our California days. I'm, I'm giving that away. Uh, and it was developed at the time when there were big tax cuts in the Reagan administration, the first Reagan administration. There was a rising budget and trade deficit at the same time, so it seemed at least superficially plausible. There are certain economic theories, like the famous Mundell-Fleming theorem, which do predict that a budget a fiscal stimulus that increases the budget deficit will also raise the trade balance under uh, the trade deficit under certain assumptions. Um, but there were a lot of other things going on. There was a tight monetary policy of Paul Volcker at the Fed trying to squeeze inflation out of the system. There was a Latin American debt crisis, which collapsed the economies of some of the major U.S. export markets. Uh, there were a lot of autonomous developments in the foreign exchange markets. There was a, a bubble, many people believe, in the value of the dollar. There were also people fleeing those financial crises in Latin America and looking for the safe haven of the dollar. So there were many other things going on be, uh, beside the fiscal deficit. And all the serious research shows that at most the fiscal imbalance explained a part of the trade imbalance at that time. Now since then, as you'll see in the data I'll show you in a minute, the two deficits have mostly moved in opposite directions, except for another few years in the uh, early uh, George W. Bush administration. And so, guess what? The twin deficits idea reappeared then. Here's a couple quotes from a few years back uh, from economist Menzi Chin at the University of Wisconsin. He wrote uh, in a 2005 report, the enormous increases in the current account deficits since 2000 largely resulted from the return of the government's budget deficit. Excuse me. After becoming estranged during the late 90s, these two deficits have recently reconciled. And then the pundits in the uh, press didn't fail to notice this. So the Washington Post, for example, wrote an editorial saying that the most effective thing the federal government could do to fight the trade deficit would be to reduce the federal budget deficit. Um, I'm going to argue that, in fact, there is some connection, but it's, it's a relatively rare uh, coincidence. These episodes of the early 80s and the early zeros were unusual. Even at those times, there were other factors driving the trade deficit. And most of the time, the two balances have gone in opposite directions. Well, a picture is worth a lot of words here. So if you just take, so the uh, reddish-orange line is the government budget balance, and the blue line is the current account balance each measured as a percentage of GDP. And yes, there's a pretty big record for the budget deficit over there. We'll come back to that in the current situation. Although you may note that there's no record for the trade deficit it actually improved. But take a look, for example, the biggest improvement in the budget balance in, in modern times, uh, pretty much between about 1992 and 2000, essentially the Clinton years. The budget balance improved by eight percentage points of GDP from a negative six to plus two. And at the same time, Instead of improving the trade deficit, that actually uh, worsened by about five percentage points of, of GDP. And if you look at most of the time periods, yes, in the early 80s, the two moved in the same direction. And yes, briefly under George W. Bush, they moved in the same direction, although at very different rates. But most of the time, they seem to move in opposite directions. Well, of course, uh, we wouldn't expect that they should move together in lockstep because the true relationship is this one. The trade balance measured by the current account equals what I call the private saving minus investment balance plus the government budget balance. So there's another key intervening variable here. Furthermore, this is only an accounting identity, something that by definition of all the variables has to be true. In economic models, we use it as an equilibrium condition, but it's not a causal statement. Uh, we can write it with the trade balance on the left-hand side, but that doesn't mean it's caused by the factors on the right-hand side. The left hand could be causing the right hand side, or the two variables on the right hand side could be offsetting each other. And they can also be, all three balances can be affected by common factors. For example, the natural movement of the business cycle is to worsen the trade balance by increasing imports, uh, lower the private saving investment balance by stimulating investment more than saving, and to improve the government budget balance. So in the business cycle, these things naturally adjust, and that's actually where a lot of those uh, contrary movements, the inverse movements, come from. 
Um, but it's not as any kind of simple matter that the budget balance causes the trade balance. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but I did some statistical work in that uh, paper I mentioned for EPI using a method called a vector auto correction model. And the basic result was, and I was, myself was somewhat surprised by this, that the uh, changes in the current account were explained much more by the private saving investment balance than by the budget balance, and that the government budget balance mainly impacted the private saving investment balance and had little impact on the trade balance at least not directly, obviously there might be an indirect channel there. So if we look at all three balances, we get a much more complete picture. And I again have highlighted this same key period in, in the late or mid to late 90s, uh, which is very interesting because you see what was going, what was, cor was correlated with the fall in the, uh, the trade balance, the blue line, was the fall in the green line, the private saving investment, which went uh, to really a, a record low, in, at least in modern times, I don't know any ancient economic history, but this was normally a positive balance that would go uh, up in recessions and down in recoveries and back up in recessions. But something very unusual happened in the late 90s there where the private saving investment balance went to a negative 4% of GDP. You see that never happened in any of these other years. By the way, most of my charts start in 1973 because that was the first year of floating exchange rates, the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. Um, and that's what's positively correlated with the trade balance, not the government balance, which was uh, uh, going the other way. And then in the uh, Bush years, of course, we had big tax cuts and two wars and 9-11 and many, many things happened. So the budget, again, went into a deficit. So that's the red going back down into the deficit. It did happen to coincide in time with when the current account was still getting worse, although it had been get it just was a continuation of a trend that had been going on for a decade by then. And, uh, but then the budget balance began to improve until the financial crisis, while the trade balance continued to worsen. So the, 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 the coincidence for those two years was, was quite exceptional. All right, so if the budget balance does not explain the trade balance, what does? Well, clearly one factor uh, is the exchange rate. I think you all know the basic economic intuition. When the dollar is high, imports are artificially cheap, so we buy more of those. Our goods are more expensive, so uh, our exports uh, suffer. Uh, so. Uh, historically, there's been a fairly close correlation, not by no means perfect, but a, a close correlation of uh, exchange rates with uh, the trade balance. And there's a famous lag. Economists call it a J-curve because of the shape of the data when you trace it out. Uh, but the basic idea is that it takes time when the currencies change value. It takes time for businesses to realign where they order goods and to get the goods produced and shipped and change contracts and so on. So the lag is we're usually about one to two years. But the dollar started falling in 2002, and we did not see that historically normal relationship that time. So this chart has the current account balance as the blue line, but it's turned upside down. It's graphed as the deficit going up, and that's on the right scale. So everything blue goes together. So that was a 6% of GDP uh, current account deficit at its peak around 2005 or so. Um, it just because it's easier to see a positive correlation than a negative correlation in a diagram. And then the red is the uh, uh, real value of the dollar adjusted for inflation. Uh, you see, that, of course, the, they don't fit like a glove, but you see, you know, they both went down together in the 70s, they both went up together in the early 80s, so the dollar went a lot higher. I could explain that later, but I don't want to take the time. Uh, they both came down in the late 80s, and then they both went up together in the late 90s. So, and, and usually the trade balance, the blue, follows the red with a lag of about one or two years, for the reasons I, I, I stated. But to take a look at what happened after 2002. The dollar peaked in, I think it was February of 2002, came down uh, quite substantially up until uh, the financial crisis in 08. But for the first four or five years, the trade deficit continued to worsen, and then it only gradually began to come down. It was still much higher five or six years out than it had been when the dollar turned the corner. So that's much longer than the earlier lags that we, we had seen. So uh, what had changed? Um, I think one of the main reasons is that the composition of our trade has changed. It's much more with developing countries and uh, transition economies like China, less, relatively speaking, less with the industrialized countries. But the dollar was falling more with those, the major currencies of the European countries, Canada, et cetera, and not with the places where the deficit was. Uh, 
So if you break down, this is a, a Fed index. It's produced by the Washington Board of Governors, not the Cleveland Fed, but you know, I'm sure uh, Dr. Humpage is familiar with this. So the green is the Fed's broad real index, the inflation adjusted broad index. It covers, I think, 111 currencies trade weighted. But if you take out separately the major currencies, which is like the euro, the yen, the British pound, the Canadian dollar, the Swiss franc, and a few others, uh, and then all the others, including the Chinese, the Mexican, the Nigerian, the South African, and everything else you can think of, uh, they show really different behavior in certain periods, and especially, I just want to focus on the most recent period since 2002, you can see that the, the fall in the overall dollar was entirely or mostly driven by the, the major currencies, while the other currencies stayed higher for several more years and then came down more slowly and never quite got as, or rather the dollar came down less and more slowly with uh, these other currencies. Uh, and yet the currencies in the red are where more, of the trade, more and more of the trade uh, was taking place. And this chart uh, breaks it down by individual currency. This is not inflation adjusted, but just the nominal fall in the dollar from its peak in February 2002 to March 08, sort of right just before the financial crisis got too awful. Uh, you see big declines over 40% with the euro, the Swiss franc, 37% with the Canadian dollar, almost 30% with the British pound, and a couple Asian currencies, the Thai baht and the South Korean won. Uh, the average decline, and the average is inflation adjusted, is 24.7%. But take a look at China, uh, only 14%, Taiwan 12%, Hong Kong essentially no change, it's a fixed rate, and uh, well, Mexico, you know, that's another story. Uh, but the point is that if you look at where the deficits were, they were, the biggest one of course was with China, which was exactly the country whose currency wasn't adjusting very much. And the, where our, the currency was adjusting, like the European Union, where the euro is, that's where we had a relatively smaller trade deficit. So, of course, the exchange rates aren't going to do that much good if they're with uh, the wrong countries. By the way, I have to say something about what Professor White said at the beginning. You were right, but not anymore. China does have a very large overall trade surplus now, or now meaning as of 2007, 2008. I haven't seen the most recent statistics. But in the most recent I've seen, uh, it was up to like over 10% of their GDP, maybe 12% of their GDP. So, 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 so it's not just with the US. Yes, that, that wasn't true, uh, I think, 10 years ago, or maybe even five or six years ago. But in just the last few years, and I think that, that's why this issue has become so much more uh, uh, you know, salient in the world today, is because now it's also a surplus with Europe and with many other regions. And it's also seen that China is displacing exports from other developing countries. So they're starting to be concerned about this. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with my Mexican friends about this because you know, NAFTA isn't doing what it was supposed to when China's taking all the markets. So, uh, or not all the markets, but a, a substantial chunk of them. So they do have a very substantial overall surplus now, but they, not originally, not originally. Uh, this is actually what has happened to the Chinese currency. Now there may be a new movement as of next week, but uh, the currency was fixed at 8.3 approximately yuan per dollar for from the uh, mid-90s when they had a currency reform up to 2005, in the, around, I think it was July of 05, they did a one-time revaluation and then gradually brought it down. This, of course, is not a floating or flexible exchange rate. It's a highly managed rate, so you see that very smooth government-directed fall. That's a fall in yuan per dollar, which means a higher value of the yuan, lower value of the dollar. They stopped the appreciation uh, when the financial crisis broke out in 08. They've been resisting pressure to start revaluing again until it looks like right around now. Uh, Geithner was just, I think, in China having conversations with them, and it's all over the press that they were about to announce another move, which I think will look similar to uh, what you saw there. By the way, this scale starts at five, so the, the, this, it hasn't come down as far as, as it looked, or gone up, as the case may be. Um, now, the fact that they're a currency manipulator should not be in doubt. Whether we should call them that officially and, and have that you know, legal process go through is another story. But the reality is, is very simple. And, and I think it's quite striking. There's a lot of talk of the US deficit and the fact that it creates an international debt. And as of the end of 2008, the most recent statistics available, uh, what's called the net international position of the international investment position of the U.S., that's a misnomer, it's actually the net international asset position of the United States, was a negative $3.5 trillion. So this is the cumulative amount owed as a result of all the historic uh, trade deficits. 
Well, actually, if you look at the details, there's a category called foreign official assets in the United States. So that's foreign central banks ownership of dollar reserve assets. That was greater than the entire net international debt. That was almost a negative four trillion. And out of that, roughly half is China. So actually, the US private sector doesn't have a net international debt. The US private sector has, it has a net international creditor position to this day. Only briefly, in a few periods, was the discrepancy in the other direction. The vast, vast majority, in fact, more than 100% of our net international debt is really to foreign central banks. And it shows you the magnitude of this currency intervention problem. Uh, not, 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 not every foreign acquisition of a dollar asset is to manipulate a currency. Current countries do want reserves for many reasons, including protection against financial crises. Uh, but the extent of this manipulation and how much it increased in the last five or six years there, I think, had a lot to do with intervention by China and a number of other countries. Um, I would also argue that when the dollar came down after 2002, another reason for its de delayed effect was what had happened during the prolonged period of, dollar, uh, of a high dollar between about 96 or 7 and, and 01, 02. And that is during that time, an enormous number of manufacturing activities moved offshore. Now you need to remember that about 80% of our trade is in, uh, goods trade is in manufacturing. Uh, and that that's also the vast majority of our trade in goods and services. It's about, I think, 56 or 60 percent of goods and services trade and 80 percent of, of uh, goods trade. So you can't have a rebalancing of trade without manufacturing. But an enormous amount of capacity moved offshore. And while in the long run that could either come back or new industries could grow up here, I think it's more likely that new industries will come rather than anything's actually going to come back. But uh, in the short run, if an industry isn't here anymore, the capacity has shrunk, you can't just you know, turn on a switch and produce more goods to substitute for imports. And so what happens is you pay more for imports if, if the dollar goes down, but you can't replace them, at least not right away. Uh, if the dollar stays down long enough, then you'll see industries come back here, though they will most likely be new industries and in new, in new locations, not necessarily uh, the things that, that left uh, uh, places like Ohio. Uh, these are the uh, implications of a paper I published somewhere else. To make a long story short, the blue line here is what's called the model baseline. So that's the, the model's fit, if you will, of the data for the uh, capital stock of the manufacturing sector in the U.S. from 1995 to 2004. And trust me, the blue line fits the actual. The actual just fluctuates a little more. Um, but then the red line is a model simulation of what would have happened if the dollar had not risen after 1995. And the basic story is that a fairly enormous gap, well, it's exaggerated by where my axis is, but it's, it's a 17% decline in the capital stock as of 2004 relative to where it would have been in the absence of, of dollar appreciation. In fact, the absolute level of the capital stock in constant $2,000 decreased after 2000. So with a essentially shrunken capacity in manufacturing, it's easy to see why, at least in the short run, some adjustment was difficult. Well, but short runs don't last forever, and adjustment has indeed come. And a, a lot of it is, as I said, been a result of this uh, economic crisis we're in. Uh, but it actually began slowly a little bit earlier than that. Uh, the drop is extraordinary, so the trade balance at its peak was over uh, $800 billion in the red. Now it's only $300 billion in the red. Uh, and some of this is lower oil prices, but by no means all. So here are some data that are where oil prices are controlled for because it's in uh, real terms, so constant, well, actually chain prices, that's a technicality, but something like constant prices. Uh, and uh, the red is the imports, the blue are the exports, and uh, a couple of no notable things. One is that when the dollar was falling, even though the trade balance wasn't coming down much initially, it was actually doing a lot of good for U.S. exports. So in about 06, 07, and even into the first half of 08, when the rest of the economy was starting to slow down a little bit, the one thing that was really booming was exports. And uh, I was giving talks about the coming economic crisis in early 08, but at that point I was still talking about exports as a very positive uh, element. Imports were starting to slow down in 07 and then of course collapsed in the recession and crisis, but the other countries joined us in the recession and crisis, so the exports have also uh, gone down sharply. Uh, and if you compare the tendency of net exports, that's exports minus imports, also in real terms, constant or chain prices, with uh, real GDP, um, you see that actually the improvement in the trade balance predates the recession. 
Uh, the trade balance in real terms bottomed out in about the end of 2006 and starting in, I think, the fourth quarter or so of 2006 began to gradually improve. Then, of course, there's a big spike upward uh, during the recession, but the improvement had indeed started uh, earlier. So the adjustment was taking place, but it was a very prolonged one in terms of uh, after uh, the timing in relation to the dollar. Okay, so why has the trade balance come down? I think I've actually gone over most of this already. Uh, we saw that China did do some revaluation. The dollar was lower with, with many other currencies. Something that isn't talked about much, it was starting to be a conversation in the business press about two years ago in 08, and then it just kind of went away in the crisis, but I think it may come back. There was some talk in 2008 of either deglobalization or re-regionalization. Remember how high oil prices were then? Remember the $4 a gallon gasoline and all that? Uh, well, a combination of, of that and other things were inducing some manufacturers, especially of heavy manufactured articles, to want to produce closer to the market and not ship from China. There are also quality issues about China, intellectual property rights issues about China, uh, a lot of issues. So uh, there were many stories in the business press of industries either moving to the U.S or to Mexico because it's part of NAFTA to feed the U.S. market. Uh, and then all of this kind of disappeared from the press because of the crisis. But it'll be interesting to see as we come out of it, where will the industries uh, locate? Of course, a big, big change is the depression of consumer spending since that time. I think we all know that story pretty well. Uh, and I would argue, I don't know whether there are other people here, perhaps more expert in fiscal policy, policy than me, that our fiscal stimulus, while we've had one, has been inadequate and maybe not well focused. And while the federal government has done some stimulus, it's only partly offset the enormous fiscal drag of, state, of uh, budget cutbacks at the state and local level, uh, which is particularly acute in states like California, which had the most, uh, 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 the biggest you know, bust of the financial uh, housing bubble. So bottom line, I'm almost done. I know I'm taking too much time. Uh, I don't expect the trade deficit to go back to 800 billion or anywhere around there anytime soon. But unfortunately, the reason for that is that I'm not terribly optimistic that this recovery is going to be really rapid in the near future. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, I'm not seeing a very robust uh, recovery. You know, we all cheered a few days or weeks ago about the news of a 162,000 increase in employment. That's after a loss of something like 8 million jobs. We have a long way to go. Now, when the economy does eventually start to pick up and employment eventually starts to increase, we will see a return of the trade deficit. Uh, how much so will depend on what's the value of the dollar then, how much of the, is the rest of the world recovering so that they're able to buy our exports, uh, whether China has done a serious revaluation by then or not, energy costs, transportation costs, all these things are going to, to feed in. And I have an interesting question. This is just a question. I, I don't know the answer to this. It's something I want to look at in the next five or ten years. We've had so much talk about outsourcing, and I've mentioned it today. But, you know, we should be careful not to extrapolate too much from the past into the future. Because there's not an awful lot left to outsource. You know? So, have we reached outsourcing satiation? Has most of what's economical to outsource already been outsourced? Or is there some new, you know, level of this that we are not yet imagining and that's the next step? I, I think for Professor White and I, when you come in here and there's a video, of a professor from somewhere else, uh, you'll know that outsourcing has really, there was a cartoon showing a group of economists at a table and they say, oh my goodness, outsourcing is really serious. They're starting to outsource economists. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the, the lower uh, skill assembly type operations are pretty much gone forever. I don't think they're coming back. When we were starting to see some industries rebuilding here uh, just before the financial crisis, uh, it was either high tech. There were several stories. I have them in a, somewhere in my computer. I have some pictures. But there was a, IKEA put up a furniture factory in Virginia. Furniture is a heavy good, so expensive to ship at high oil prices. Uh, there was a British high tech company that also put up a factory in Virginia. Well, I'm in Washington. We're right near Virginia. So we got all the Virginia stories in the Washington Post. Uh, and then there was a big story about Ford Motors deciding where they were going to build their um, low cost, fuel efficient cars. And the answer was, Toluca, Mexico. Okay, well, that's not Detroit, but it's also not China and it's not Asia. It's in North America. And of course, if it's in North America, it's going to use North American components. Uh, so there were some interesting hints of maybe industry coming back, of maybe things changing, but then in the crisis, you know, we don't know 
where that was going. What can we do? I, I do think the dollar needs to stay down. I don't think it's a panacea. In some sense, the markets are making this happen anyway, in spite of the blips with the crisis and then the Greek crisis, but the dollar is still much lower than it was back in uh, 2001 or 2002. But this needs to be on a more balanced basis. We don't need more depreciation with the euro. We need more depreciation with the yuan and, and the other East Asian currencies, those that are more or less pegged to the yuan. And so how to pressure China has been a big issue, although maybe it's about to get off the table. Uh, there's the arguments about naming it a currency manipulator under our law or threatening a tariff. I'm sure Joe could tell us about the proposals in Congress uh, for that. There's something called the Buffett Plan. That's not Buffet. I think I left a T out of there. Uh, the Warren Buffett, not Buffet Plan, which was to issue import certificates, uh, which would be given to exporters, and you'd have to buy an import certificate from an exporter to get a license to import. I never thought that had any political chance. If my discussant wants to know why that was in my paper, it's because the people who sponsored the paper insisted that I talk about it. I never thought it had any political chance, and I'm actually pretty critical of it. But uh, what the administration has done, like all administrations before Obama, if they've done anything, I think the Bush administration did almost nothing, but, uh, but uh, that's not partisan, because the Reagan administration did and, and other Republican administrations in the past. Uh, and that is quiet behind the scenes negotiations. The Chinese are very proud. They don't like to admit that they're doing something under pressure, but they're actually not unreasonable. They might want to do something anyway if they realize that either they have to or it's in their own interest. And it does look like they're about to announce a return to, to revaluing the yuan, uh, but they want to do it on their terms and they don't want to be labeled something before they, they get to that point. Um, I think more broadly, though, we ought to be thinking about more international cooperation. Back in 1987, under another you know, left-wing Republican president named Ronald Reagan, uh, there was a, the Plaza Accord, where the U.S. and what were then, I can't remember how many countries, I think it was G5 in those days, there weren't as many Gs, uh, got together and negotiated uh, sort of target zones for currencies. They were de facto, they weren't de jure, but no targets were ever announced, but implicitly they decided the dollar should stay lower, what were then the European currencies pre-euro would stay higher, and the U.S. should try to do a fiscal adjustment, and all those other countries should try to stimulate. And frankly, the need for that kind of pattern hasn't gone away. If anything, it's greater than before, though the players have somewhat changed, and now it's more uh, China than, than, than Japan, though Japan is still uh, a, a part of this issue, and so is Germany. Um, and so what's crucial, and then I said I've been talking too much about the U.S. here, because the imbalances really are global. And a very important point was made by Ben Bernanke, so I want to come back to that, that it's not just what the U.S. does. You know, we are a big part of the world economy, but our imbalance is with the rest of the world. So you have to also explain the foreign surpluses. And so the, the very high saving rates, the excess savings, the depression of, of wage income and, and, and middle class consumption in, in other countries, they are the other side of the coin of our problems. And uh, we're never going to get out of them unless those countries devote more of their resources toward raising average living standards, increasing consumer spending, where a higher currency can help because it would make their consumer goods cheaper, uh, letting wages rise or productivity, uh, and, and so forth and so on. So there's a lot to be done in terms of uh, international cooperation. And I think without that, this is all going to be uh, a lot more difficult. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much. Presentation. Well, is, that, is, that, uh, is, is that is that is it this one? No. Nope. Oh, I think it's right here. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. All oh, right. So, uh, I'm looking up here and I'm seeing even keel of the great inflation. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm doing a paper on that. What the hell's beating me? <laughs> How's that possible? Uh, with that, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Owen Humpage. <laughs> Glad no one's doing research on even keel. It's all right. Truth in advertising, I didn't graduate from Case in 1974. I graduated from Case in 1986. I started at the Federal Reserve Bank in 1973. And so the two guys, so if you don't like my speech, you can, you can blame Professor, Dr. Erdelich 
he signed my dissertation, <laughs> and, and Dr. Rostiger also did, and they helped me a lot. And, uh, but I got to say, and, and I, I like to say this to people that work at Case, uh, economists talk about marginal gains. Uh, the professor that gave me the biggest marginal gain in knowledge in my entire education is Professor William Peirce. I learned more from that guy than from any other single person I've ever met. So with that, I just, uh, I, I have four comments, right? Trade deficits are good things. It's an identity. It's not a causal relationship. Clear? They're jointly determined endogenous variables. And three cheers for free trade. So if you don't understand that, let me explain them. Let me start back here. Every morning across the globe, over two billion households wake up and they make three decisions. They decide whether to go to work that day or enjoy leisure, whether to consume a lot more than their income that day or to save to consume in the future, and how to spread their income on that day among the various goods they can buy whether they're domestic goods or foreign goods. They make those decisions with the idea of making their lives better off. That's important to remember. They're make, trying to make their lives better off. And the outcome, one of the outcomes of those decisions are the current account or trade deficits and surpluses across the globe, right? Now, as we've gone over the years since World War II, and trade has become more liberalized, and international flows of currencies and finance has increased, you would absolutely expect the trade deficits to get larger. That's because funds can now move across borders. So savings can go from, say, China to where they have a higher return, right? individuals could buy goods across the globe. You would expect current account deficits to be bigger. A point pointed out by Martin Feldstein long ago. All right. If you tell me, so because of that, when you tell me there's global imbalances, I have hardly any idea what you're talking about. All right? If they're global imbalances, you should be able to tell me what the correct balance of payments is, what the correct current account deficit it is. And it's sure not zero. So what is it? I mean, this sounds like I'm, I'm giving, you know, giving cute stuff for a speech, but this has been an issue. What is a sustainable balance of payments deficit has been an issue since post-World War II in the development of Bretton Woods. And no one has ever answered it. All right? So now let's look at the U.S. current account deficit. It's been, so this is the U.S. current account deficit expressed as a percent of GDP. And we've had a, almost a persistent current account deficit since 1982. That little blip in 1991 is actually an artifact of the first Gulf War primarily. All right, so we've had these persistent deficits. And what's happened to the United States? We've had great growth. We have had strong job creation. It's been so good, a lot of economists label the period from the early 80s to up to the current recession as the great moderation, right? Done pretty good. We've had two recessions in that. That's before the current recession. They're amazingly moderate, and we've had no inflation. So what's the deficit done? I don't understand. If you look at Australia, they had very large deficits. They look like they're doing okay. Canada also had large deficits. They're doing pretty well too. So I don't understand the connection between a large deficit per se and all sorts of bad things happening. Now, having said that, I'll take a half, oh wait, one other thing, sorry. This is business fixed investment in the United States as a percent of GDP, right? So now look at it post-1982. It shoots way up. I'm going to show you later that that's not unrelated to the trade deficit. Is that in 
That's a percent of GDP, so it's yeah. expressed that way. Is it real over real or nominal over nominal? It's real over real because of the change in right. prices of investment goods. Exactly. All right. Okay. I'm going to step back a little bit from this. Not quite yet. All right, so I'm going to step back. And it, it, if you tell me there's a problem with the trade deficit, there's kind of two ways that could be a problem. The first has to do with sustainability, all right? For sure, a country can't keep piling on a deficit faster than its GDP grows, right? Because what you're doing is you're buying more imports from the rest of the world. You're not exporting to pay for those. You're issuing claims to the rest of the world. So those people are holding claims on your country, right? Financial claims, uh, stocks, bonds, treasury securities, all right? Your ability to pay those off is related to your GDP. So those can't keep growing as a percentage of your GDP forever. At some point, investors will back off from holding those and they'll demand a risk premium and that'll show up as a rise in your interest rates, your real interest rates, relative rates in the rest of the world, and a depreciation in the dollar. But those two events will start to turn the current account balance around, right? So there's been a long debate in economics about whether this would be fast or slow. So the debate first erupted in the early 80s. Nothing real bad happened. I heard it again as we got past 4% of GDP. We went up to 6% and still nothing really bad happened. Same thing in Australia, same thing in, in uh, Canada. Now, countries do get in trouble with this. They're often developing countries, and the problem arises because they have to finance their current account deficits in, in non-domestic currencies. So for example, if you're Argentina and you run a deficit, and I don't know if this really applies to them, but you have to finance it in US dollars, then it's hard to get dollars to pay off your deficit down the road. The last thing I should say, uh, I should also say here, um, down the road, you have to pay off those financial claims, right? So if your economy isn't growing, you have to pay those claims, you have to pay those claims out of consumption. So if your economy doesn't grow, then paying off those claims out of your consumption will lower your standard of living. But in the United States, we've had a boom in investment that continues growth, so it's not clear that those present a challenge to our future standard of living. One last thing on this. Now, if you tell me the current account is unsustainable because in those decisions that households make, governments have somehow stepped in there and kind of disrupted those, either by taxing or by some way they spend money, or, as in the case of China, manipulating their, well, I shouldn't say manipulating their currency, <laughs> screwing around with their currency markets, <laughs> then that's okay. I don't have a problem with that, right? But I don't like to say, well, that, all right. Incidentally, just to be a little provocative, <laughs> I don't, you know, China does not get a trade advantage from their exchange rate peg. China gets a trade weight, a trade advantage from their ability to sterilize the inflows. I'll leave that for later if you would care. Okay, it's not an identity, it's, okay, I was going to wait until afterwards, would that be okay? But, but ask me, all right? Okay, it's not, it's not an identity, it's a causal relationship. All right, so, all right, what I have up here is a, a chart. Uh, I is investment, SD is total savings in the United States. SF is foreign savings coming into the United States, the flip side of a current account deficit. E is the statistical error. SP is private savings. SG is government savings. And SP and SG add up to SD. All right. These all come out of all sorts of interactions in the economy, right? It's, a, it's the com combination of two identities the income identity and the balance of payments identity, right? There's not, strictly speaking, any kind of causal relationship among these things.
Okay? So let's sort of look at these and I'll, I'll tell you some stories. If you look from 1981 to 1992, what do you see? Well, you see domestic savings went down. Oh, these are expressed as percentage of GDP, and there are changes in that. So, so from 1981 to 1982, savings as a percent of GDP, total domestic savings in the United States as a percent. Oh, one other thing. I did this a long time ago, and I was asked to come here early this week, and I didn't have a chance to update these. That's why they kind of lag behind. All right. So, but they're in a paper I wrote which you can all look, and if you download it, my boss will think it's a really great paper, and it'll affect my wages, so do that. All right, so be, between 1981 and 1992, domestic savings fell by 5.1 percentage points of GDP in the United States. All right? Now, if you look over to the far right, uh, part of that was private savings, but a good chunk of that was government savings, which is the, related to the deficit. The deficit was getting larger, right? All right. Investment fell by 4.4 percentage points, and you could say that the thing that stopped, you know, made up the difference was we got a lot of foreign savings in here, right? Okay. So in this year, for sure, the government budget deficit was relate, you know. You know, I don't know if you want to say it's causally related, but for sure, all these things matter in these, these outcomes. They all matter, right? Okay, from 1992 to 1999, investment grew by 3.5 percentage points of GDP. Private savings in the United States grew by 2.7 percentage points of GDP, and the rest was made up by an inflow of foreign savings that was related to our current account deficit. They helped us pay for more investment than we could otherwise have. Good deal. Not only did we get cool stuff from them, but we got them to invest here. All right. Over this period, for sure, a lot of the increase in savings was a reduction in federal budget deficits and state and local deficits, and private savings actually fell. Now, you could turn these things all around and tell all sorts of other stories. So I could have taken out the savings private savings and put in income minus consumption, and I could have taken out foreign savings and put in a current account deficit, and I could have said something like this. From 1992 to 1999, consumption in the United States rose a whole heck of a lot, and we bought a lot of stuff from the rest of the world. You could say that too. My point is, these are income identities, and it's not strictly true to talk about them causally re related as they are here. But you can put them in a model, you can think of them in a model. And so I just have one other comment on this. In, um, got to look at my date here. In 1992, I investigated this, probably because my boss thought it was a good idea. And I wrote an article, Introduction to International Implications of Fiscal Policy. In this, I took a very simple model of the economy. I didn't, right? I assumed a budget balance, and I showed that fiscal policy, even though you don't have a deficit or surplus, can affect trade. How is that possible? Well, the way the government taxes, the way the, gov the goods the government spends on, affects savings decisions of the private household. Now, my point here is no big thing, just to tell you that all these things matter. Fiscal matter policy also matters for trade, whether or not there's a deficit or surplus. All right, the next one, and I'll finish real quick. Um, next one. They're jointly determined endogenous variables. There is no relationship between the dollar and the current account balance. Startling, isn't it? I'll say it again. There's no relationship between the dollar and the current account balance. They're endogenous variables. They're determined by something else. Now, if you've ever taken economics, you've seen a supply and demand model. If you go out in the world and you started to notice, say, at, at, at Lowe's, that prices of lumber were going up, but a lot more Lowe's was selling a lot more lumber, you wouldn't say the law of demand doesn't hold. What you'd realize is the demand for lumber is going out, 
prices are rising along with quantity. The same thing applies to the relationship between the dollar and the current account balance. So I'm going to tell some more stories. This is the U.S. current account deficit expressed as a percent of GDP, and it's that real broad dollar that Bob was talking about earlier, all right? Um, 1982 to 1985, Federal Reserve was conducting a very tight monetary policy. Uh, the Reagan administration <laughs> cut taxes, cut, ex expended, increased, <laughs> cut taxes a lot, increased military spending, you know, like this. <laughs> But the Democrats in Congress refused to cut other private spending and cause the budget deficit. I'm just horsing around, just showing you that identities are hard to talk about causally. Anyway, so the, the, the federal budget deficit expand. The Fed was tight monetary policy. Interest rates in the United States rose substantially. And what happened? Foreigners said, oh, it's a better return in the United States than it is in my own country. And so they started moving their funds into the United States to buy up treasury bills and other instruments. But to get those treasury bills and other instruments, they first had to buy dollars, because they're denominated in dollars. The dollar started to appreciate. As the dollar appreciated, imports became cheaper in terms of dollars. Foreign goods became more expensive in terms of dollars. Aggregate demand shifted away from US goods to the rest of the world, resulting in trade deficit. The point is, if it's a financial inflow, the dollar will rise and the current account deficit will increase. All right? Night. Uh, well, that, so that's because they're demanding more dollars, but the dollar is depreciated? Yeah, if you're a foreigner and you want to buy a U.S. Treasury bill, you can't come in here with German marks. Right, so treasury doesn't want them. Okay. All right? So you have to have dollars first. So you buy those dollars, and you force up the dollar in the foreign exchange market. I think, you, I think she heard depreciating, but you said appreciating. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I often, it's known in my family as an Owenism, okay. switching things. Sorry. So, uh, well, I'll go through a few more, and we'll see if I do it right. 87 through 90, the dollar depreciated, and the current account deficit got smaller. Depreciated and smaller. Foreign savings was coming out of the United States, right? Let's go up to where I get in trouble with my boss. 1995 through 2000, again, a huge inflow of foreign savings. Foreigners were shifting savings in the United States. They were driving up the dollar. The current account deficit expanded, right? Okay, again, an inflow of savings. In fact, if you kind of think about this, a whole lot of these current account deficits aren't caused by increases in U.S. aggregate demand, but foreign savings coming in the United States. Okay, here's where I get in trouble with Bernanke. 2000 <laughs> to 2006, Bernanke claims it's a savings glut. I don't think that's right. I think what happened was the <laughs> Fed was too eased too much, along with fiscal policy. Aggregate demand expanded in the United States. Here's what happened. Aggregate demand rises in the United States. We buy U.S. goods. We start buying goods from the rest of the world. To buy those goods from the rest of the world, we have to have their currency. So we sell ours in the foreign exchange market. The dollar depreciates, as it did. And the current account deficit rises. As the dollar depreciates, our financial assets look good to the rest of the world. They start buying them. And they accommodate the expansion in the trade deficit. The point of this is, there's no simple relationship between movements in the dollar and movements in the current account. Just like there's no simple relationship between price and quantity in a supply and demand model. It depends on what's driving everything. Okay, last thing. Sorry, I'm doing a little longer. Three tiers for free trade, right? Okay. It's unequivocal. Free trade increases the size of the economic pie, right? It increases the size of the economic pie. It allows for specialization, allows you to get goods you couldn't otherwise have. It increases the size of the economic pie. Unfortunately, that's not all it does, right? 
Studies suggest that if you take the world and split it be skilled labor and unskilled labor, it gives them both a bigger piece of pie, right? Now, the unskilled is a little controversial, but I'm sticking with my story, right? It gives them both a big, bigger piece of pie. But even though the unskilled labor gets a bigger piece of pie, proportional to the skilled laborers, it gets smaller, all right? So if you don't like free trade, you, you got to ask yourself then, what's ma what matters? A bigger piece of pie, absolutely, or a relatively smaller piece of pie? What, what are you most concerned about? And last, because it's important in the paper, I thought I'd say a few words about manufacturing in the United, United States. Um, what I have here is three lines. The green line coming down is manufacturing employment as a percentage of non-farm employment in the United States, and it's dropped from roughly around 30, 33% at the end of World War II down to below 10% recently, all right? Okay, so the question is, is that related to trade or something else? Now, the other two lines here are Manufacturing value added is a percent of private sector value added. And that line looks pretty flat. And manufacturing value added is a percent of GDP. That line looks pretty flat. But in fact, there's a slight downward tilt in that. And it's small, but statistically significant. All right. Now, if trade was hollowing out was the cause of the hollowing out of manufacturing and jobs in the United States, you'd also expect to see the output of the manufacturing sector decline relative to the rest. Those two other lines wouldn't be virtually horizontal. They would also be downward tilting, right? Okay. So what this suggests is that manufacturing productivity is being increased, uh, manufacturing output in the United States is being held up by massive improvements in productivity. And it suggests that what's underlying this, the decline in, late, in manufacturing employment is not trade, but it's technological change, right? Now, so I went to Robert Feenstra's graduate text to check this out, he's a leading trade economist, and in fact, that's what he says too. Trade is not statistically insignificant. It is significant in these studies, but by far the largest part of the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States, according to these studies, is attributed to technological change and not to tra trade. Sorry, I just get excited. Okay, so bottom line is, you don't want to put on trade restraints, right? You don't want trade restraints. Trade restraints, at best, is a zero-sum game. Most likely, it is a negative-sum game. And so I'll try to answer any questions about my four comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Right. I think I'd like to give uh, Professor Blecker an opportunity to make a couple of comments in response. I'm not sure if he wants to stand next to these, <laughs> in front of these things or not, but he can, he can speak from here now. No, and great. and uh, I, no, why, tell you what. Just leave that up because I can talk right. about the Right, okay. Well, why don't, why don't we move these over so you both can answer the all questions. Right. So right. you can speak from here. You can all see it. But I don't need two microphones. All right. That wouldn't be fair. Uh, well, <laughs> there's a little technical, technological oh. problem in moving the microphones. Um, well, I'm trying to think of who my boss is. It's certainly not Ben Bernanke. I'm the department chair, so maybe I'm my own boss. My dean is a professor of French literature, so he's not going to tell me he doesn't like my economic theory. He's got to believe whatever I tell him. But Ben Bernanke was my professor of first quarter uh, macroeconomics in graduate school. So uh, uh, at least uh, uh, maybe that's why I had more sympathy for his theory of the saving glut. He's anyway. a good teacher, but he's no Ossimeritalek. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, having these four points up here is, is actually maybe a good place to begin. I, I completely agree with number two and three. And I think that, although I, maybe I said it in somewhat different terms, uh, you could state a lot of what I said as identity, 
It's an identity, not a causal relationship. I think I said that. And everything's jointly determined and they're endogenous variables. Yes, although I, I would caution that while the exchange rate is an, an endogenous variable, at least if it's a floating rate, not the yuan, uh, it's an endogenous variable lar largely in a financial model, not in the terms of the variables we're discussing here. On the first point, are trade deficits good? Well, there's a, if I may paraphrase Karl Marx, a rational kernel in the mystical shell of this statement. It is true that the trade deficit gets bigger in good times for the natural reason that when times are good, you buy more imports, so your trade balance goes down. But I wouldn't go so far as to say trade deficits are good. Uh, they might be good in some instances, like if you really need to borrow a lot to finance your economic development and you're a poor country and you're borrowing at a sustainable rate so you won't have a financial crisis later. But I wouldn't go so far as to say they're always uh, uh, good. And I think if they're too large, too sustained, and you are maybe heading for that financial crisis, maybe they're not such a good thing. Um, as for free trade, I'll give two cheers. Uh, my reading of the literature is that those less skilled workers in the U.S. didn't just get a relatively smaller, bigger piece of the pie. I think they actually got less pie. I don't think it's all because of trade either. A lot of it's technology, uh, for sure. Um, but uh, I think they've had an absolute decline in, in, in living standards and, and real wages. Um, that, look, there's much to agree with in, in what Professor Humpage said, but this will only be interesting if, if I add to the controversy and, and talk about the, the parts where, where I disagree. When, when an individual wakes up in the morning, there are some very lucky people who have that decision about whether to do labor or leisure that day. But for the vast majority of people, they don't have the luxury of that choice. They may have enforced leisure, like the 8 million people currently out of work, or the manufacturing workers who were displaced, whether by technology, trade, or, or managerial malfeasance, or, or whatever. Uh, but those folks don't have a choice. They're going to have leisure, but without enough income to live on, and maybe soon not a roof over their head if they can't pay the mortgage. Or they may have to go to work, because that's how they earn an income, enabling them to then make those nice spending and saving and consuming decisions later on in the day, if they have any time and energy and left over. Uh, but I think the labor-leisure choice is actually one of the most misleading ideas in economics and that, uh, you know, people actually value work. They really want to be active and useful and engaged. And until we economists come up with a theory of labor that recognizes that, we're going to have a hard time explaining the real world and why those eight million people who are currently out of work don't feel so lucky. Um, a few other points. What is the correct balance of payments? Well, yeah, it is I mean, some concept of sustainability. There, there's not a magic number to it. A lot of people talk about something in the range of a 2% of GDP surplus or deficit being sustainable. I don't think 6% is, is, is sustainable, and not even if you can borrow in your own currency. Um, all that wonderful stuff that we had in the great moderation seemed to come to a pretty crashing halt in this great recession and big financial crisis. And thanks to Ben Bernanke and many others, we have maybe avoided a great depression, uh, but it doesn't look like returning to that luxurious economy anytime soon. The reason on those investment statistics, the reason I asked if they were measured in real terms as I thought they were, is that you see a big upward trend, but I think what a lot of that is is, is the falling prices of um, uh, computer software and that they're kind of exaggerating how much real investment there is uh, because of that, but I have to check into that uh, more. Um, uh, well, it's funny, I, I, I gave a talk on, the, uh, on this at a different meeting a couple months ago and I was attacked also by somebody because I was defending Ben Bernanke, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, there, there's two sides of this coin. You know, the, the trade balance between the U.S. and the rest of the world is an endogenous variable of what's going on both in the U.S. and in the rest of the world. So I don't think explanations that focus on the American side and explanations that focus on the foreign side, like the savings glut, are necessarily mutually exclusive. They're, they're, they're talking about uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, and I will just conclude by saying that in my international trade course, I use Feenstra's textbook. Oh, good. And also in, in the undergraduate class. So yeah, I'll stop there. I didn't mean this there. to be an attack. I thought I had to be controversial. Or otherwise, I'd invite your wife or your brother or something like that. You no, know, so. I want real controversy to invite my brother. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's have a chance for people to ask questions. If you want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand and Zach will bring you the, the microphone. Uh, any questions? I mean, I could certainly pose them, but yes, miss. Hi, uh, my name's Joy. I was just wondering if you could right? go back to explain what you meant by trade sterilization or okay. what, the old sterilization thing. Okay, so so I th I think a lot about about China and do a lot of stuff with the the renminbi and think about that. And uh, in fact, again, just to plug my own work, you can find a lot of stuff in our Economic Trends magazine on the international section that I write. So you, you know, if you think about a trade uh, a trade a fixed exchange rate, you know? In and of themselves, they're, they're not really important for trade advantage because you have the exchange rate and then you have the price of the foreign goods, right? Now, if you have a, a, an exchange rate and you keep it too low, what's going to happen is, like China. So China keeps their exchange rate too low. I think we'd all agree with that. So a lot of foreign dollars flow into China, all right? Now, the Chinese traders end up with dollars, and the central bank says, hey, you can't have those. Bring them over here. And then they give them to the, the People's Bank of China. The People's Bank of China then hand those traders renminbi. So what's happening in China? The money supply should increase, and their prices should rise, right? And that should kind of cut out their trade balance, their trade advantage, right? So what they get on the nominal exchange rate being pegged they should start to lose on the, on the rate of inflation. But what China does is then it turns around and it sells into its market renminbi-denominated bonds and takes those, those, um, the renminbi back out of the market. In, in econ speak, that's called sterilization, right? So you're offset, <laughs> so, so they offset the effect on, on the price level. Now, here's what, I honestly, I just don't understand. I've been watching this for years. And, and, and according to my calculations, recently they've been sterilizing 50 to 60 percent of that inflow. But now think about what's going on in their banking system. Their banking system's got to be ended up holding on to these bonds. And that's got, it seems to me, I mean, it's got to distort the banking system. And I can't figure out for the life of me how they can keep doing it. I mean, Germany did this during the Brent Woods period, but eventually Germany couldn't do it anymore. You know, it was just distorting their markets. So that's the thing I don't understand about China. But that's the thing that's key here, I think. And if I were in the Treasury, what I would be doing is kind of tackling that issue and the nature of not having uh, market-based banking and stuff like that. I'd like to hear Professor Bleck as a guest, and I don't know if Professor oh. Schroeder would like to comment on that e later. <laughs> no, I, I think that, that's really a very important and, and not well understood point about that it, it's the ability to intervene with sterilized intervention that makes this all possible. So Dr. Humpage is absolutely right about that. I think, you know, the fear that this might turn inflationary is very much in the mind of the Chinese monetary authorities. And one of the places where there's internal pressure to let the renminbi or yuan appreciate is from the central bank, because I think they're worried about whether they can continue to do this. Inflation has been creeping up there. It's not very high, but, but you know, there's concern about that. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is in China's own interest to stop the current policy, uh, because you know, they may not be able to continue this sterilization uh, forever, though they've done an amazing job with it up, up until now. But I would point out that in most textbook models of all those endogenous processes, they assume no sterilization. So I always tell my students, this is how it works with sterilization, because that's what an awful lot of governments do. Any further other questions, please? Come on, somebody's got to have something. Yeah, uh, Paul? Hold on, he's, he's. I just make a comment about this. Uh, to the Chinese government officials who refuse to change their system, sterilization feels good because it is helping to fuel economic growth. I'm not an economist here, a um, political scientist, but the bottom line in China, in my estimation, is that economic growth equals stability. Now, what you point out is that how long can they hold these 
bonds, they can't do it indefinitely. And that's one of the things that I think that China is, uh, excuse me, is toying around with uh, allowing periodic limited floats of the currency and <clears throat> ergo changing their bond structure. But the underlying problem is that they want to keep doing it because it equals political stability. And in, in the absence of a uh, multi-party system where policies can change, and they're not about to do it overnight. They're, they're going to tinker with the system until they can't do it anymore. And when they can't do it anymore, then they may be in trouble. I'd like to pose a question. Uh, um, we talk about the, the fiscal imbalances in the U.S. and, and, the, and you know, the, the global imbalances and how they affect the U.S. economy and so on. But I was wondering if uh, Professor Black or Dr. Humpage would like to talk about how the uh, current uh, set of valuations of currencies and financial flows affect uh, other countries. I mean, I know that Robert spent a lot of his time working, you know, early on working on Mexico and on Latin America, and he might have some comments on that. And um, and uh, you know, and 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 how the Germans pull it off. <laughs> you know, you, you know, what explains the Germans and the Japanese and their and, and their large surpluses? Because you know, in, in his in his figures, you would see that you know between the Japanese and the German surpluses, that's just about equal to the Chinese almost. So, so you know, what's going on over there? Do you want to, Robert? My expertise on what's going on inside each of those countries is, is limited. There may be other people here who know, know more than I do, but I'll share what little bit of my ignorance uh, I, I, I can. I, I, I believe in Germany, uh, as in many countries in recent times, wages have lagged behind productivity. There's kind of a low level of consumption and, and excess savings. So it's very much part of the, the savings glut phenomenon. In a lot of Asian countries, and China is a tremendous example, uh, families are really forced to do a lot of the saving. So that, that decision, uh, after they've got the income you know, to spend it or save it, well, there's not a good retirement system or pension or social security, so you have to save for old age. There's not good health insurance, so you have to save for a medical emergency. There's not a good mortgage system, so you have to save for, basically you have to save for everything, uh, which is all very well and good, except it doesn't create uh, demand, so then they have to depend on other countries and exports for, 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 for demand. Uh, so, uh, you know, those kind of internal reforms in China are, are another thing that, that has to happen to develop domestic financial markets and to open up some of, uh, some of those things. In Japan, Japan has always been a bit of a mystery to me because uh, they seem to be chronically unable to stimulate their economy, though they had some growth uh, a, f a few years ago, uh, but stimulus policies don't seem to work. They seem to be the only place in the world where people actually read those economic theories and save more in response to the government spending. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's almost like a culture of high saving and not, not, uh, not, not spending enough. Um, so, I I'm not sure. But in terms of, uh, you know, one thing that, that I have looked at more is how this plays out among uh, developing countries. So what you see is that uh, as some countries have succeeded in pushing their exports, holding their currencies down, uh, grabbing a lot of foreign markets, other developing countries have been pushed out more. So there's been a number of examples of this, like uh, there was a big blow for free trade a few years ago, five years ago, when the multi-fiber arrangement was, was abolished. And so all the developing countries were hoping to get more markets for their uh, textile and apparel exports. Well, it turned out they didn't all get more markets because some of them were actually benefiting from having quotas uh, and they had a hard time competing with China and some of the other lower wage East Asian locations. So some countries like China got, and this is in Feenstra's undergraduate textbook, got much bigger markets but many others including Mexico and Central American <coughs> countries actually lost out. Um, and the currency values matter uh, there. So the, I actually have in a paper on uh, some papers I've done on, on the Mexican economy, I have a graph of the Chinese-Mexican exchange rate, yuan per peso or something like that. And, uh, you know, it, in the first six or seven years of NAFTA from about 1994 to 2000, 
uh, although Mexico suffered in many ways from its currency crisis, it actually got quite an edge in exports. That coincided with when the U.S. economy was booming and NAFTA gave a real psychological edge and brought in a lot of foreign investments. So they had a big export boom and it looked like NAFTA was, was this fabulously successful thing. But after, since 2000, their manufacturing employment has uh, stagnated and it's actually not mostly productivity growth there. It's mostly uh, slower export growth and a lot of industries moving offshore from Mexico to uh, various East Asian locales or cheaper locations in, in the Caribbean or Central America. Uh, and so they've actually lost a lot uh, from keeping their currency high because that was their strategy for fighting inflation, uh, and while China was doing the opposite and keeping theirs, theirs low. So you know, there's a lot of implications uh, all over the place. And I, well, that's all I can say at this moment. I was wondering if, uh, if either of the panelists would comment on, on another question, which is, it seems to me that much of the theory of free trade might not even be true in the normal sense anymore. If the classical theory assumes that there's comparative advantage um, and that some places are better at making one thing and some places are better than making another. And there's, there's some truth to that still. But it also seems to me that particularly when transportation costs get low enough and when technology and capital are mobile enough, all of which to some extent happened in the, in the, in the 1990s and the, in the last couple of decades, and, this, and the transportation cost factor is shown in, in Professor Blecker's comments that when, professor, when they get high enough, again, when they go back up, uh, maybe these, these effects uh, change. But it seems to me there's a possibility that at some point you're not really talking about trade among nations, you're just talking about a larger labor market. And to the extent that you're talking about the labor market having doubled in size, basically, uh, so that uh, you know, American workers are competing with workers all over the world, that, and, and German workers are competing with workers all over the world, that the, that the expansion of trade, making trade easier, basically means that um, wages, that, that the high wage countries, wages are going to stagnate or go down, even if they are tremendously productive and they increase their productive productivity substantially, as in Germany. Wages are going to go down. And so that uh, what we are looking at and in some sense uh, seeing in the United States uh, and have seen basically since 1973 for a series of reasons is a stagnation of wages for everybody except people who are selling untradeable goods. <laughs> uh, basketball players and so on. And, uh, and uh, so... Well, well Yao, Yao Ming is in some sense tradable, but he, had to, he did come here, okay? Right, right but, but, that, but that in general, um, that, that what we call trade is at some level just an expansion of the labor market in a way that uh, has distinct effects on wages in, high, in previously high wage areas. And so I guess my question is, what, you know, what do you see as e either of you as the effects on wage, yeah, as, as the long-term effects on wages of trade at the moment? And um, maybe after that, if there's no further questions, we'll turn it, out, turn it over to Professor Helper to make final comments. Uh, well, I, don't <laughs> uh, I don't know. I sort of think of trade today as being, as people are com com compartmentalizing their production processes and shipping them out to the place that, we, you know, it's the cheapest to produce it, you know. Um, it's, you know, there's, it, it seems, this goes on all the time. I mean, it's happened in the United States. You don't have to talk about an international labor market. I mean, it happens in the United States. It happens in, within cities. It happens all, all the time, right? And so what happens to this? Does this make us worse off? No, because there's inexpensive goods and people buy them. So their standard of living has to go up. Um, now, if there's distortions in the income distribution, That'll probably happen. But overall, it, it seems, whether it's international, global, local, or among a bunch of people. I mean, even at work, I don't do everything, right? My colleagues specialize in some things, and I specialize in others, and that makes us better off, right? So it's got to improve the standard of living, uh, but I don't deny there could be some shift in, uh, in uh, the income distribution. I could talk for a very long time about international trade theory. 
Maybe you'll invite me back for that. Uh, but let me just share a few thoughts right now. There are a couple of, uh, I actually love international trade theory. I, I teach it as often as possible, even while being department chair. But I think there are some important theorems and, and concepts to, to bear in mind that, that are very directly relevant to this issue. And of course, one of the giants of international trade theory is the late Paul Samuelson, uh, who passed away, I think, just last year. And I saw him give a talk when he was already past 90, and he was as lucid, sharp, and bitingly sarcastic as ever. Uh, most of us said, we hope we're half as lucid when we're 70 as Paul Samuelson is at 90. Anyway, Samuelson came up with two very, very important theorems that are important to uh, take into account here. One is called factor price equalization. And it's in a very idealized model, so the assumptions aren't totally realistic, but there's a core of truth to it. So it says that in a globally integrated economy where there's no trade barriers, now the world's not exactly that free trade, but it's much closer to that than ever before in history, and where technology is the same everywhere, well, that's not quite true either, but it's also more true than it ever was in the past because you could put up a factory in China just as productive as one here. Uh, and under lots and lots of other assumptions, for each type of factor of production, they will get the same real income, wage or rent or whatever it is, no matter where they live so that a certain type of unskilled labor would get the same wage in any country, the same kind of skilled labor or scientists would get the same wage, the land would get the same rent, the capital would get the same returns, and so on. Now, neither Samuelson nor anybody thinks that's literally true, but what is true, I believe, and I think it's really come to the fore in the last 10 or 20 years, is that once you have a lot of trade liberalization, while we're not exactly having equalized factor prices, I think our factor prices are very much tied together and held in some kind of relationship to each other. Because we see this mystery that Professor White was alluding to, that in country after country, we have very rapid productivity growth, like in the US and many other places, and moderate productivity growth in other places, like uh, Mexico or somewhere, and we don't see the wages going along. But that's actually what you would expect from factor price equalization, because your factor prices are not determined by what happens in your country, and they're not even directly linked anymore to, to your own productivity, they're linked to global labor market conditions. And then you have a global labor market in which something like you know, a billion extra fairly low wage workers have been added in in the last two decades, and you're not gonna see wages increasing anywhere. So in Feenstra's undergraduate textbook, where he mostly gives lots of cheers for free trade, and even for NAFTA, but he admits one interesting thing. And I've shown this in paper after paper, uh, since NAFTA, real wages have not increased in Mexico for production workers in Mexico. They fell in the peso crisis, they came back up after that, but they've never gotten uh, higher than they were in 1994. It's almost it was 16 years later, and because now they fell again in the crisis. So lots of things grew, exports, productivity, you name it, but not real wages. Why? Well, the theory was that integrating with the United States and Canada, those richer countries, was going to pull up the wages. But they didn't just integrate with the United States and Canada. They opened up to the whole world, and so did the United States and Canada. And we're all, I think, in much closer to a factor price equalization kind of situation today than ever in the past. And don't forget that technology is mobile. That's actually part of the story. Capital mobility actually has the same effect as trade in terms of uh, equalizing factor prices. They're not equalized, but I think they are held in check. Um, the other great theorem of Samuelson is the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. This is uh, the story of what happens when prices change as a result of either opening up to trade or imposing a tariff or, or whatever. So let's play the story in terms of you open up to trade and you liberalize imports uh, so, so goods get, th those goods get cheaper. And the answer is that for the factor of production used relatively intensively in the production of those goods, their real wage will go down, assuming, let's say, it's a kind of labor, like less skilled labor. Now, it's true the goods got cheaper, just like Dr. Humpage said. The goods got cheaper, but the wages fall even more than the goods. That's in the graduate textbook of Feenstra. That's in my graduate class. It's, this is called the magnification effect. Uh, and so you get an aggregate gain, the overall GDP rises, though that's probably fairly small, one or two percent, the wages or income of the, uh, in that case it would be the uh, abundant, relatively abundant factor in the country, which might be capital or skilled labor or something, 
That goes up because their price goes up and the goods are cheaper. But for the intensive use factor, the demand for that factor falls so much that even if you have a totally free market, no government intervention, market clears, their wage will fall by more than the price of the goods, so they're worse off. And I think that the, these theorems, even though they are stated under very idealized conditions, they may not sound exactly realistic, they are of great relevance and of increasing relevance to what's going on uh, in, in the world today. So I would say trade theory has a lot to say to explain uh, the things you're talking out about if realistically applied. So long as you have the right parts of it, okay. Um, any last questions from anybody? Yeah, okay. Should we invest in global equity stocks? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a great last question. It, is an I economist of the Fed allowed to comment should, on that? Should we invest in global equity stocks as opposed <laughs> to U.S. equity stocks? I will rephrase it slightly. I want to know the answer to that, too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, and I'm not allowed to tell you, but I'll tell you a story. So I was going to dinner with a bunch of guys from the – a bunch of international economists from the Fed right after the Fed opened its investment thing to, uh, to global stocks, you know? And so as we were walking to dinner, we each turned to each other and go, hey, have you started to invest in global funds? And it turned out absolutely none of them had, so, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't because they were savvy. It's just because they were too lazy to actually look at how to I do it. I think, because they've done well, I think. Well, yet, yes and no, and, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just not as if all the other world economies have done so well either. I would like to ask Professor Helper to make uh, – Final closing remarks. Maybe you should come up here where there's a. And uh, on my own behalf, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Humpage and Professor Blecker and Professor Helper for putting together this program and all of you for attending. Great. Well, I'll try to be really quick. Um, I guess I can't resist. I do a lot of work on manufacturing about saying a couple things about manufacturing. <laughs> that, uh, I guess I can disagree with both panelists. Um, uh, on the first thing about sort of whether we've reached the end of offshoring and whether uh, um, we've what's going to remain is the highest skill stuff. I think that's actually not, I, I think we don't know either of those things. Um, first of all, the kind of heaviness constraint and the skill constraint can work in opposite ways. And so often what you see is, in fact, the assembly stays in the U.S. because it's close to the market uh, and stuff is often heavier to ship after it's assembled than before. Um, so there's no necessary idea that we're going to keep the skilled stuff and, and uh, not the unskilled stuff. Um, and second, you know, in terms of things that we could offshore, I think there's a lot left uh, in terms of services. I mean, there's a paper by Alan Blinder that says about a third of service jobs, you know, could conceivably be done offshore, not least uh, the jobs of uh, the three of us. Um, and so I think that that raises some questions about uh, if we are going to balance the trade balance, uh, how, how are we going to get there? And I think. One of the points I think that both speakers made really well, um, oh, oh, before I turn to that, let me say one other thing about the, um, the productivity of manufacturing. Um, I think if, uh, I noticed that the graph that Owen showed uh, actually ends in 2007, because if you look at value added as percent of GDP in the last couple of years, it's actually started to fall. Um, and even that, those numbers are actually uh, pretty well, um, we can pretty well say with a lot of certainty that those, the value adders overstated uh, for two reasons. One is because of the inability to track well the increasing import levels. Uh, is a quite complicated argument, but it has to do with um, when you do a chain weighted GDP index, you have to start from somewhere. And if what you've done is you've taken goods that you were buying, intermediate inputs that you were buying from the U.S., now you're buying them from China, there's no kind of price to change it from, from China. So it looks like an increase in productivity. What it really is is a, a movement of stuff offshore. Uh, there's also um, problems in how we account for the incredible increase in, in uh, computer productivity. So uh, it looks like we're making all these computers. So what's really happening is we're making computers with very much more capability. And again, the way the price indices are, are created, that looks uh, like um, 
uh, productivity uh, in manufacturing. Um, so I guess I, this leads me to, to, to actually uh, think that, in fact, there is a lot more to, to this idea of um, redu reduction in capability uh, due to trade, although, uh, of course, the technological uh, improvements are, better, are, are, of course, important, uh, and also just the, the kind of how much physical stuff can we fit in our house is, is, becomes important. Um, so, but then to, to turn to the uh, commenters, I, I learned a ton, um, and I think one of the things that you guys both stated very clearly is um, kind of the role of accounting identities and how, uh, so we, we, they all start, you guys all started from this sort of basic thing of, uh, um, if you, so X minus N, the trade balance, has got to equal S minus I, the savings investment balance, plus uh, T minus G, the government balance. And then different theories, which they kind of talked about implicitly, but different theories that tr attribute different causal weights and causal mechanisms. So I think that's one of the things that really shows the power of economics, um, that these things are going to balance, but how they balance is going to depend on your theory. And those of you who are my students know I often sort of say, you know, when they, we want to think about why do economists disagree? We have two flavors, two reasons. One is differences in how the economy works and different values. Uh, so I think there were um, maybe uh, three disagreements, um, three apparent disagreements, two real ones, I'll say. Uh, so one, should we worry about the trade deficit? Uh, to what extent is free trade good? Uh, those are the real disagreements. And the third one is sort of what's the role of government deficits in the trade deficit? And I think you guys both, with varying degrees of emphasis, said, yeah, there's some role, but it's not the only thing. Uh, so on these, these other two questions, um, I think it comes down to uh, some issues about, you know, to what extent you know, on the, the way the economy works, um, I think in um, uh, Dr. Humpage's view, it's, uh, we have prices that move a lot very quickly uh, as a result of individual choice, not a lot of lags. Um, in um, Professor Blecker's view, we have a lot of lags, uh, so we see that it takes time for people when the exchange rate changes to change who their supplier is. Um, uh, unemployment, and many things are not sort of individual choice based in uh, Professor Blecker's view. There is, a, there is a n involuntary unemployment. Um, then we secondly, I think, have a very different uh, difference in values that kind of leads, uh, kind of uh, leads to a difference in emphasis. Sort of, are we talking about consumption? Or are we talking about jobs? And what role do we place, uh, what value, what importance do we place on who gets that consumption, who gets those jobs? So the role of distribution of income. Um, so that's the, uh, the summary of the two. And I think it's a really interesting uh, laying out of two very different views about trade with some overlap um, and a lot of uh, fruitful discussion. So. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all.